which is provision, uh, you will find Article 85 of Additional Protocol 1. Uh, there are certain acts in Additional Protocol 1 uh, which amount to grave breaches of uh, the laws of war. And out of those grave breaches, some of the acts which are mentioned uh, in Article 85 is, are that if uh, the civilians are made an object of attack or if indiscriminate uh, attack is launched which affect the civilian population or the civilian objects or if there is an attack which is launched against those works or installations which contain dangerous forces or if an attack is launched making non-defended localities and demilitarized zone the object of attack in that case what happens that uh, it amounts to grave breaches there is also another act which is mentioned in article 85 which says that if the attack is made at historic monuments works of art or places of worship then also it will amount to grave breaches of Geneva conventions and of additional protocol one the question which arises is that even if the law says that it amounts to grave breaches of the laws of war uh, so what does it mean how what is the seriousness look seriousness is that the words there are two words grave breaches grave breaches uh, these two words are very important grave it's not simple bridge it's grave bridge right and there is another is bridge that some obligation has been breached right so bridge of the provision of the convention which is obligatory on the states and second, it's not any kind of ABC breach, but it is a serious grave breach. And therefore, you will ask the further question that what happens even if there is a grave breach? The answer is that if a state and its officials commits grave breaches of Geneva Conventions and Additional Protocol 1, then there may be uh, a probability that uh, the person concerned may be prosecuted in uh, a trial or maybe at an international level trial or maybe at the domestic level trial it depends so because these acts are very uh, serious uh, acts uh, so Article 85 of uh, the Additional Protocol 1 is very important. You must have a look at it. The next uh, important way in which those provisions that we have discussed in the last class and in today's class, that how those obligations which are there on the states as well as those officials of the state uh, to abide by the the, the 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 mandate of international humanitarian law uh, you will find that there is also a second very important instrument which is which is called uh, rome statute of international criminal court the Rome Statute of International Criminal Court, perhaps all of you might have heard, if you have not heard, I will discuss this thing when uh, I will get an opportunity to discuss uh, International Criminal Court with you. Uh, because uh, if you have any questions, please uh, hold on and you can chat. Yeah, you, you send your uh, text message. What I was telling you that in the Rome Statute of International Criminal Court by which another institution has been created 
which is called International Criminal Court. Now that International Criminal Court works on the basis of a law. And that law is called Rome Statute. Uh, the whole functioning of International Criminal Court is based upon the Rome Statute. Rome Statute, apart from other things, Rome Statute tells you that what is the jurisdiction of International Criminal Court. By, the, by my voice. So what I was telling you that the Rome Statute of International Criminal Court uh, also has certain provisions. One provision which I will tell you today is Article 8 of the Rome Statute. What is Article 8? Article 8 of the Rome Statute discusses about the jurisdiction of International Criminal Court on different crimes. And Article 1 takes up only one crime. And that crime is called war crime. War crimes, what is the exact definition of war crime? That I will tell you uh, when we will discuss uh, International Criminal Court and then uh, before that ICTY or ICTR. But at this moment of time, I will just tell you about the relevant portions of Article 8, which pertain to the means and methods of warfare. And there are five, six subparts of Article 8, Paragraph 2, which deal with the different acts which amount to such grave breaches and which amount to war crime during armed conflicts. And what are those acts? Let us try just to see at Article 8 and then uh, Paragraph 2, Subparagraph B, and thereafter six uh, rules in Subparagraph B. What are those? The first rule is there in Rule number 18, which says that if the parties to the conflict employ poisonous weapons or weapons which contain poison that may amount to grave breach. Second says, rule number 18 says that if a party to the conflict employ the gases or liquids or any materials or devices which are analogous to these kind of gases and liquids and these gases may, may be uh, such which can make a person unconscious. Asphyxiating gases, poisonous gases. So if a weapon is employing these kind of gas gases, then that may amount to the grave bridge of the Geneva Conventions. It further says in rule number 19 that if a party to the conflict employ those bullets which expand in the body, when it pierces the body, it expands. Now in that case, what happens, and I have already discussed with you that there was a separate treaty on dum dum bullets, which those kind of bullets which expand when it pierces the body. Rule number 20 of Article 8, Paragraph 2, Subparagraph B says that if a party to the conflict employ weapons or projectiles which are causing superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering, or which are inherently discriminate, that is also amounting to a grave breach. So these are the basic rules that we have discussed in Article 35 of Additional Protocol 1. And uh, about the poisonous gases, uh, I have told you that there is a separate treaty. And I will also tell you about some of the other treaties which are separately dealing with different kind of weapons. Right, but Rome Statute in Article 8, which discusses about uh, war crimes, this has incorporated uh, uh, those acts which amount to war crime when you use certain weapons. Now, these are the rules on weapons in Rome Statute, but also there are certain rules on the, uh, what you call uh, strategic methods of war, you know, strategy like, 
suppose if the uh, party to the conflict adopts a strategy by which uh, they will say that no we will uh, go on to uh, commit sexual violence against women uh, outrage their modesty and this will also weaken the the enemy force now whether that is also uh, acceptable the answer is no not now uh, so in today's times if women will be used as a means of warfare uh, women will be uh, subjected to torture or subjected to such outrages of personal dignity uh, and if they will be raped that also amounts to grave breaches in rome statute also if you look at rule number 21 of article 8 paragraph 2 sub paragraph b you will find that this rule is also incorporated rule number 22 of the same article of rome statute says that if a party to the conflict commits rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization, or any other such form of sexual violence, that will amount to a grave breach of Geneva Conventions. So you, you, you can now understand that the enforcement of Geneva Conventions, although it has taken a little bit longer time, but then gradually the road towards making warfare a kind of humane warfare, that road is now becoming smoother and smoother. It's not totally smooth even today. Even today wars are being fought and the rules of warfare are every day they are being flouted by the parties. But that does not mean that there is no law on warfare. That does not mean that the, the parties to the warfare, they have unlimited choice of means and methods of warfare. So uh, these are the uh, some of the basic things that I wanted to tell you today, uh, which uh, uh, are regarding the enforcement of international humanitarian law pertaining to means and methods of warfare. Separately, apart from these uh, enforcement measures, I will tell you that separately, there are treaties in a particular area which say that this weapon should not be used. And those separate treaties are, for example, uh, those separate treaties are first, I told you because this uh, whole trend is called Hague trend. So the trend started in 1899 and 1907. And uh, in those conventions only, uh, what weapons should be used and what not, those were uh, described. But apart from that, separately, in 1925, in Geneva, there was a protocol which was agreed by the parties, which was called Geneva Gas Protocol. Now, in this Geneva Gas Protocol of 1925, uh, the use of poisonous gases during warfare, that was prohibited. 1925 is a time when, you know, the First World War was over. And you might have watched in movies that in the First World War, uh, the gases were used, poisonous gases were used. You might have heard about uh, you see uh, different uh, uh, types of you know uh, warfare during the first world war and different types of gases poisonous gases were also used because in those times poisonous gases were already uh, in use by the parties uh, so and in the second world war the poisonous gases uh, were again used if you look at the Second World War, if you look at some of the examples and the famous example in, during the Second World War was the example in Germany. In Germany, what happened that the Jews, uh, uh, they were uh, discriminated uh, by, the, uh, the, by the Germans. And what happened that you might have heard that people were put in gas chambers. Right? Jews were put in gas chambers and they were stuffed to death. So these kind of 
these kind of uh, these kind of uh, uh, weapons in which gases are used uh, those have been used as a method of warfare but whether the question is whether it is fine whether we can accept it whether as a civilian of today we, whether we can accept it or even if somebody is a military commander whether military commander should be allowed to use any kind of means of and methods of warfare the answer is no because it is it is uh, not simply because i told you in the last class that the whole objective of military or armed conflict is to to weaken or to to win the war it's not that you kill the people it's not that you you destroy the whole village and the whole population and then you will win you will not this is not the winning uh, real win the real win is simply that okay you defeat you have defeated or you have weakened your enemy right so that is the purpose of any kind of conflict uh so this can this purpose can be achieved which is called military objective or what you call military necessity i had given you the definition of military objective as well as military necessity in the last class apart from that you will find that there is also a separate treaty which is uh, on toxin weapons those weapons which uh, use the toxin gases uh, or biological weapons right nowadays uh, people uh, sometimes uh, some people say that uh, one country in the world it has used the biological weapon and there therefore now we are facing this pandemic right so uh, sometimes uh, if suppose if this is just an allegation or what but now it, uh, at this moment of time we cannot be sure right but you see that whether there is a conflict uh, whether there is a use of biological weapons now these kind of questions are always there right so in 1972 there was a separate convention which was agreed to uh, by the by some of the parties in the world and which is called uh, biological and toxin weapons convention of 1972 biological and toxin weapons convention of 1972 apart from that there are also different treaties i will just let you know about some of the basic treaties which are fine like i told you about the uh, the geneva gas protocol secondly i told you about the biological weapons convention third is conventional weapons convention conventional weapons right what are those conventional weapons like uh, the use of rifles uh, rifles bullets right uh and uh, uh, tanks these are conventional weapons now uh so these conventional weapons like incendiary weapons uh, which uh, which uses fire as a method of uh, attack right uh so these are all are called conventional weapons right so conventional warfare in the conventional warfare whatever weapons are used those are covered under the conventional weapons convention right so this is the convention of 1980 and today it has uh, five protocols and india has been signatory to all these five protocols of uh, conventional weapons convention india is also a party to biological weapons convention uh and uh, i will also tell you that uh, there is also a separate convention which is on chemical weapons you might have heard that uh, chemical weapons are also being used uh, at different uh, points of time in the human civilization uh, when the chemical weapons were uh, discovered uh, in fact weapons were not discovered but chemical uh, the 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 whole uh, chem, chem, uh, chemicals were uh, manufactured and then those were used uh, to destroy the other party uh, so uh, these kind of chemical weapons so on chemical weapons there is a separate convention which is of 1993 chemical weapons convention and if you look at uh the basic provisions of these conventions you will find that in these conventions not only the use of chemical weapons or biological weapons uh is prohibited but even the manufacture of production of these weapon these chemicals or these biological things they are prohibited 
So uh, unlike Genova gas protocol, where only the use was prohibited in the 1993 chemical weapons convention, as well as in 1972 biological weapons, even the manufactured is also prohibited. So the, the humanity, the cause of civili human civilization, that is growing towards better times. And also you might have heard about uh, anti-personnel land mines convention. That is also a separate treaty. Uh, although India has not signed it because India has the fear that um, many of its neighbors, they employ anti-personnel land mines. Uh, so unless they will not sign, we will also not sign. Right? So this is how, so, but there is a separate weapons convention on and that weapon is anti-personnel land mines. That is of 1997. And finally, uh, uh, there is also a convention on the use of cluster munitions. Cluster, you might have heard about the bombing, uh, uh, cluster bombing uh, in different uh, zones of warfare. So in 2008, a separate convention on cluster munitions, uh, those, uh, uh, that's that, that convention that came into being and uh, India has also not signed that convention uh, cluster munitions. Uh, so what I was telling you that uh, these are some of the basic provisions and uh, these are some of the basic treaties and conventions on, uh, on, uh, on these uh, uh, means and methods of warfare. Now I will tell you about some of the examples by which you will understand that how uh, these rules and regulations, they have been abided by the parties and how they have been flouted by the parties and what were the results of such kind of you know, uh, the flouting of those obligations. You might have heard about uh, a famous trial which is called Eichmann's trial. E-I-C-H-M-A going on in the 60s, early, so from 1960 to 1962, Eichmann's case. And who was Eichmann? Eichmann was uh, the military commander in Germany and uh, he was very close to Hitler and what he had uh, done that he had uh, uh, made most of the Jews uh, go to the Auschwitz concentration camp uh, in Austria and they, uh, many of the Jews were stuffed to death by, uh, by this person, Eichmann. And what happened that uh, when uh, Germany uh, finally uh, it was defeated by the Allies after the Second World War. Eichmann had fled. And uh, the whole war was over and then people were, you know, trying to find out where it was Eichmann. Uh, ultimately, you might be surprised to know that he was just, he was, he was uh, found by uh, the Israeli uh, intelligence agencies in Argentina. And uh, from there he was arrested and he was brought back to Israel and then in Israel the trial, trial began. And uh, there, the whole, uh, you know, trial proceedings, if you look at the trial proceedings, you'll find that uh, one of the charges which was leveled on Eichmann was commission of war crime. And uh, out of different other acts which he had committed, one of the uh, charges which was that he had also uh, used gas uh, during uh, this uh, Second World War uh, against the Jews. Uh, so, and who were Jews? Jews were civilians. They, they were not combatants. So, uh, so what you see that uh, Eichmann's trial went on for uh, more than a year and finally he was sentenced to de death. So you see that uh, uh, these kind of people, <coughs> they, are, they are arrested and uh, if they are brought before uh, the, the legal uh, the legal regime uh, and the legal institutions, they have to face the music. Uh, in the Second World War, you might have heard after the Second World War, uh, International Military Tribunal for, the, uh, for this Germany uh, that was established, that was established in Nuremberg. And you might have heard about Nuremberg trial. In Nuremberg trial also, uh, some of the people against whom war crimes were leveled, those people, one of the charges were that they had committed a war crime because they had used the gas against the civilians. So this is
uh, Al Anfal case is uh, the case which was decided by uh, the Iraqi uh, High Tribunal. You might not have heard about Iraqi High Tribunal, uh, but that was the tribunal uh, which was constituted uh, uh, when Iraq was invaded by US and then uh, Saddam Hussein was captured and then Saddam Hussein and his uh, other friends, they were all captured and, uh, no, sorry. Yes, Ali Hassan. So Ali Hassan, uh, he was, one of the charges against Ali Hassan was that he had used uh, poisonous gas as well as chemical weapons against their own population, which was a, which was an ethnic minority population. And that population was Kurds. No, you might, you might have heard about uh, Kurds uh, in Iraq. So those Kurds against those people, uh, Saddam Hussein had used or he had ordered the use of these kind of weapons in Iraq. Uh, so, and many people, you know, villages of uh, Kurds population, they were destroyed. Uh, civilians, they were just bombed and uh, you see, they, they just died. So uh, uh, those weapons caused a great loss uh, in Iraq. Uh, may some of the uh, Kurds, only few Kurds uh, were left behind. And may, most of them, they had fled. So it was a situation. And when this Iraqi high tribunal was constituted, uh, uh, Hassan, he faced trial. And finally, what happened that he was, uh, uh, he was punished with capital punishment. So he was to be hanged. For some political reasons, his hanging was delayed, but ultimately uh, he faced the music. So the thing is that it is not that laws of warfare are just you know uh, in the rule books. Laws of warfare are there and which are enforced uh, after the war is obviously after the war is completed. Uh, I will also Vietnam War. There was a chemical which was used in Vietnam because Vietnam had. Uh, in 70s, it was a case of 70s. Uh, Vietnam in, in uh, or, uh, the whole Vietnam War started in the late 60s and finally it went up to 70. So in Vietnam War, what happened that uh, United States had used uh, some chemicals in that war, and those chemicals uh, are called Agent Orange. Right? This is uh, this this was called by United States as a defoliant or herbicide uh, by which those herbs, small bushes, those would, would be destroyed because at the time of attack by the United States in Vietnam, uh, it was full of you know small jungles, bushes, uh, small forests. And therefore, uh, what United States wanted to have because it wanted to establish air bases and uh, nearby air bases, it had to destroy huge amount of uh, uh, the plant species. So what it did that it used defoliant uh, or what they called it, they called it herbicide. But, but uh, ultimately it was known by the Vietnamese that many people who were living uh, nearby, the whole soil was contaminated and people were affected by uh, those, that contamination. And what happened that many people, they were maimed and they, many people, uh, they felt the the brutal effects of those chemicals by the United States. And many people uh, uh, even died out of uh, that contamination. Uh, so uh, uh, what happened that after the war was over, a uh, lot many cases, those were, uh, uh, those were started in United States. Some of the cases were instituted by the war veterans themselves in United States uh, and separately after some time, uh, some other class action suits were uh, instituted in the United States by the Vietnamese uh, people who were, uh, who were joined by association. So Vietnamese association, there was a Vietnamese association in New York and they instituted uh, a, a suit in the Brooklyn uh, District Court in New York City. So there also the whole contention, what they did, the Vietnamese Association, they filed 
uh, the suit against chemical companies like you might have heard about Monsanto, big multinational company, uh, Dow Chemicals. These are some of the uh, and even the suit was instituted against Dow Chemicals, right? And uh, if you look at the proceedings of uh, the district court of uh, Brooklyn in New York City, you will find that the contention of United States was that we did not use chemical uh, weapons as such. What we did that we used defoliants and defoliants were uh, not prohibited uh, as a means of warfare. But on the other hand, what uh, Vietnamese association, they were contending before the district court, they were saying that look at the effect. It is all clear that it was not simply a kind of any kind of herbicide, but it was a kind of dioxin, which is uh, poisonous and poisonous uh, chemicals were used and therefore this was a very serious act of breach of international obligations. However, the court was not uh, accepting the argument of Vietnamese association because at that uh, till that moment of time because this was a case which was instituted in 1970 and during that time the whole international uh, precedent that was not very clear uh, against uh, the use of defoliants and therefore that that situation was exploited by United States in its own favor and United States successfully even argued before the appellate court of uh, uh, New York, which is Second Circuit Court, and uh, in Manhattan, in New York City, and with, uh, there, uh, United States also finally uh, contended that no, this was not the chemical weapons, but this was simply a herbicide, and uh, finally it was accepted by the appellate court. So the thing is that these are the thing conventions, uh, rules of the convention. Those are very useful as a student of law. When you will uh, practice in the courts of law uh, uh, in India or maybe at international level, uh, you may find uh, some of the situations which are coming to you uh, where uh, international instruments on laws of warfare that may be relevant. And uh, uh, I remember uh, just three, four days back, I had received a call from one of my former students uh, and what he was saying that, sir, uh, do you know what happened? I said, no, what, what happened? You are just calling me. He said that, sir, I have, I have got a case uh, in which international criminal law is also one of the issues. I said, no, no, it may not be because uh, how can international criminal law issue come to you? He said, no, sir, but uh, this is the truth. So you see that if you, and uh, he reminded me that, okay, some someday in one class I had told him that, look, uh, uh, you do not know that what is going on in, at present. But uh, sometimes in future or sometimes you will uh, know that what is the importance of international humanitarianism. And then he was very happy that, okay, sir, you have taught me this and that. So the thing is that uh, international humanitarian law provisions, uh, it seemed to be, you know, just a fascination kind of thing. But it is not just a uh, fascination, but it is a reality. And uh, people who flout it, they always uh, have the daggers of international humanitarian law, you know, hanging uh, before their heads. I'll also let you know about some of the recent uh, 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 armed conflicts in which uh, these rules have been flouted, but sometimes uh, those have been enforced also. Three, what happened that uh, Egypt, uh, uh, which was uh, which was ruled by a uh, very famous leader, his name is uh, uh, Nasir, uh, Mahmoud Nasir. So Nasir was ruling Egypt for a long time. He was uh, kind of, you know, Nasir, uh, Nehru, our own Nehru and Nasir, they were friends. But Nasir, uh, in one of the situations in Yemen, uh, so uh, Egypt and Yemen, they are neighbors. So in Yemen, what happened that Nasir uh, supported uh, the rebel forces against the then autocratic leader of Yemen. And uh, what he did, that he should not have done that, what he did that he had also uh, helped the rebels by giving them, you know, uh, those weapons which are containing chemicals like gas. And, uh, uh, and uh, in 1962, uh, it was noticed by, by many countries of the world. Uh, but coming on to the present time, 
you know, if you look at uh, the television like CNN or you should sometimes watch BBC International, BBC or CNN. So then you will uh, come to know that in Yemen, there is a country, Yemen. I just told you about Yemen. In Yemen, the civil war is still going on. And in the uh, uh, Yemeni civil war, uh, you might have heard that Saudi Arabia, uh, it was allegedly involved in the use of chemical weapons in Yemen. So, uh, uh, you might have heard about a very famous journalist whose name was uh, Jamal Khashoggi. And uh, it is said that Jamal Khashoggi was about to give evidence uh, to the whole international media that uh, Saudi Arabia was involved in the use of white phosphorus munitions in Yemen. And then he, he was killed in, you, you might be knowing that he was killed in Istanbul. Uh, so uh, the thing is that even today, uh, that I'm giving you the example of uh, the, the recent years uh, when in Yemen, uh, such kind of, you know, use of weapons which are prohibited and those were used. I will also tell you about uh, another country which is Syria. Uh, you might be knowing that uh, in Syria, the civil war is still going on. And uh, uh, I was not knowing too much about, uh, even today, I'm not knowing too much about Syria, but then uh, one of uh, the senior students of law faculty of University of Delhi, uh, I somehow I just met her and uh, she I said uh, where are you from she said I am from uh, Syria so then I asked her that okay so what is the problem going on in Syria and then she explained that okay this is how so the thing is that in Syria uh, the civil war is uh, uh, still going on and uh, you might have heard uh, that uh, the president of uh, uh, the president of uh, Syria. Nandini, just wait for, uh, just after five minutes, I will take all the questions. Uh, so in Syria, uh, the president, the president of Syria, uh, Bashar, Mr. Bashar, uh, so it is alleged that he has used chemical weapons against uh, his own population, right? So uh, you see that, uh, if you look at the whole world, you will find that, uh, you know, uh, the whole world uh, looks like, you know, a very beautiful place to live. But then at the same time, there are many situations which give you uh, the lesson that in those situations, people become brutal. Uh, the leader becomes uh, brutal against uh, its own uh, people, you see, even if there is a dictatorship, but then he is representing the whole state. Uh, the dictators should not take away the lives of the people, right? So, uh, but then uh, once they start flouting the rules of international humanitarian law, uh, maybe that just now because they enjoy the power, so they are not facing the music of international humanitarian law. But then there will be definitely a time when these people will face uh, such kind of threat of uh, prosecution. Uh, I will just uh, give you two, three more examples and then I will uh, take your questions. Uh, one uh, more example I will give you about Sudan. No, you might have heard about a country, uh, Sudan, which once upon a time it was very famous. No, even today, uh, Sudan, Sudan is famous for its uh, ancient civilization. But then, uh, in the recent years, uh, at least uh, since the last uh, decade, uh, Sudan has become uh, famous for armed conflicts, and Sudan was divided. Now there are two countries in Sudan. One is Sudan, and other is South Sudan. And uh, you might have heard that whole fight started because uh, the whole, uh, you know, multinational companies, they were, were trying to you know, grab natural resources from Sudan. And uh, one of the natural resources in Sudan is uh, gold and other is obviously petroleum. Uh, you see, so, you know, so Sudan is a seat, uh, place where there is a civil war going on. And uh, in South Sudan, what happened that uh, even sexual violence was used as a means of warfare, right? So now these are the things uh, which are prohibited. I told you about uh, the prohibition of uh, sexual violence as a means of warfare against women. So, but this was this was uh, Al Hassan, Al Hassan's case. Uh, he is from a country of Africa, and that is Mali. And from Mali, 
uh, this case uh, has gone to International Criminal Court and uh, it is a charge against uh, uh, Al Hassan that he destroyed uh, mos mausoleums. You know, mausoleums are the places where Muslims uh, pray. Uh, so uh, he had destroyed mausoleums uh, of Muslim saints. You know, Muslim saints in India even today. So we have uh, much regard for uh, those Sufi Muslim saints. So likewise, uh, in uh, Mali, what happened that Ali Hassan, he had no regard for uh, the mausoleums of Muslim saints. And what he did that he destroyed those uh, mausoleums. And not only that, he raped women and allowed forced marriages. He was also engaged in sexual enslavement of women and girls. Right. So uh, this case is before International Criminal Court. Uh, so the thing is that he was a very powerful military commander in, in Mali, but now he, is, uh, he was arrested and now he is before International Criminal Court facing the charge. Uh, one of the ground of charge was that uh, uh, he uh, had violated, he had gravely breached uh, the Genoa Conventions. Right. Lastly, I will also give you one very important uh, example of uh, uh, a lady. I have been telling you about, you know, those very great, great things. But I will uh, now give you an, an, an example of a lady who was engaged in the fight against uh, the people uh, who had used uh, different kinds of violent means of warfare. And uh, this lady uh, won the Nobel Prize for peace. Do you know the name of the lady? Her name is Nadia Murad. Nadia Murad won the Nobel Peace Prize of 2018. And you know what, what she did? She was belonging to a minority community of Iraq. And uh, that minority community is called Yajidi, Yajidi minority community. And uh, what happened that uh, uh, in 2017, 2016, 17, what, uh, 2015, 16, 17, what happened that uh, she was captured by ISIS forces and uh, she was raped. And uh, then uh, she was uh, captured and put at a place and somehow by the grace of God and what? Uh, she fled the place and uh, one of the neighbors uh, uh, of that place, uh, that family, they gave her shelter and finally that family was able to send her out of Iraq. And finally now she is living in Germany and in, uh, in 2018 she was given the, uh, given the uh, Nobel Peace Prize for that. You see. So, uh, and if you look at her story, uh, uh, today what we have tried to learn, we have tried to learn that uh, the means and methods of warfare uh, are not unlimited, it is limited by the laws and uh, we have learned what are the laws on it and we have also learned what are the cases on it. So, uh, with this, uh, I am open to uh, questions. Just uh, give me one minute so that I will... Uh, Unmute you all.